So in the study that we have presented at American Heart Association at the 2009 conference, w this was a study devoted to post-mortem genetic testing for autopsy negative sudden unexplained death. So first of all, when we think of sudden death in the young, about a third of those kind of youthful sudden deaths, the medical examiners, the coroners, the forensic pathologists can't give us an explanation for why the young person died. These are called autopsy negative sudden unexplained death. And we've learned through doing post-mortem genetic testing or what we call a cardiac channel molecular autopsy that in about 25 to 35 percent of those cases, we can find a putative mistake, a putative spelling error, a genetic mutation in one of the genes that give rise to one of the types of genetic heart rhythm diseases that are called the channelopathies. And so in this study, knowing that, one of the things we wanted to begin to do is to say, what would the right kind of evaluation be for the survivors of a sudden death victim. And so we try to model out there because right now, if there's been a 20-year-old who dies suddenly, there's a sense that we should bring in all of the relatives, brothers and sisters, offspring, if there's offspring, parents, and we should do a major full court press on those survivors to see if we can find any indicators of a heritable and inherited heart rhythm condition. And so we can do all kinds of tests on them. ECG, stress tests, Holters, imaging of the heart, echocardiography, cardiac MR, and so forth, to try to find the subset where that, that relative who died suddenly, that he or she died suddenly because of the presence of one of these inherited heart conditions. What we wanted to explore in this study is might it make more sense and might it make more cost-effective sense if we put all of the initial full court press on the deceased individual who holds the answer for his or her untimely and so far unexplained sudden death and that we would focus our energy on doing the cardiac channel molecular autopsy on that person and for the 25 to 30 percent where the aha moment is realized where we said we have caught the culprit, that then we would then do a targeted exploration of those deceased individuals' relatives. And so that's what the study was. It was really a study of taking uh, nearly 200 unexplained sudden death victims who had been referred to Mayo Clinic's Winland Smith Rice Sudden Death Genomics Laboratory by coroners throughout North America. We did our molecular autopsy on them. We found that about 25% of them had a potential explanation. And then we charge modeled, we modeled what would be the charges to the circle of relatives of doing first, a, had, had we done first, a commercial genetic testing for these diseases, not my free research laboratory test, but the commercial product that are out there by more than one company now. And we would compare that to the standard of care, if you will, of doing all the tests on all the relatives all the time. And at least in this first cost effectiveness analysis, and it really should be called a charge effective analysis because it's what it charges, we saw that there would be about a million dollar savings in this cohort by focusing the initial energy on the deceased individual who holds the answer or who might hold the answer. I really think that this observation needs to be a conversation starter. We need to study and begin asking the question, what's the right way of doing the sudden death evaluations of those loved ones left behind? Should we keep doing the status quo, which is to order a lot of different tests, and all, as long as we code them appropriately, not as screening codes, insurance companies are more than happy to pay for the entire battery of tests. Or might it be more effective, not only charge effective, not only cost effective, but actually clinically more effective 
to focus on the energy, the initial energy, with a test called a cardiac channel molecular autopsy that is currently a genetic test that is not generally covered by insurance plans. And it's not a surprise why it's not. As you know, oftentimes insurance companies are very reluctant to pay for tests while we're alive. You can imagine that they're even more reluctant to pay for a test on somebody who's already dead. And yet the point might be that it would actually save the insurance company far more money by doing the decedent genetic test, by testing the deceased individual who holds the answer. I don't know if that's going to turn out to be the way that it will be, that it will be the most effective way. There's many unanswered questions. What test would we do for all of the relatives for the three-fourths of the deceased autopsies where the genetic testing was unrevealing? There still might need to be some sort of a workup in them. And we modeled that in this, in this analysis. We said if we did not find a genetic test answer in the deceased individual, for those relatives, we would do the whole battery of tests. And even doing an initial analysis that, that is admittedly crude still needs a lot of further investigations. We already saw the potential for a million dollar savings for the first 150 deceased individuals and their family members who were put through this type of analysis. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there are way more than 150 unexplained sudden deaths that occur in the United States in the, in each year. That estimate is going to be at least 10 times greater than that. Mm -hmm. So just in this little exercise, there's the potential for on the order of a $10 million savings.